You guys can grab a seat. Grab your seat. It's wonderful to have you in church tonight. I feel like we've done so much already, which is fantastic. Father, thank you so much for this amazing night. We could sing of your love all night, God. You are absolutely amazing. So tonight we surrender to you and we ask that you'd speak to us. God, we need to hear from you tonight. We need to know more about you. We need to know more about your character and your unchanging nature toward us. All about who you are. So Father, tonight as we lean in, as we engage, as we have pen and paper ready and our Bibles open, Lord, would you speak to us? Holy Spirit, would you reveal more of who you are? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? This is really the big question. You can't piggyback your way into heaven. It's not that you, you can't say, well, you know, I know someone who went to Hillsong. I, my mother's sister's husband's dog was a Christian. There's no piggybacking. You, you, you can't get into heaven because you knew someone who knew someone. I mean, that might get you through to Tropfest tonight, but you're not going to get into Hillsong you're not going to get into heaven, you get into Hillsong, you're not going to get into heaven because you know somebody else, that you, someone who is a Christian or because you once went to church or because you've got a Bible at home or none of those things. You're not going to heaven because you go to Hillsong either. You've got to answer that question. Jesus is asking every person on the planet, who do you say I am? The title of tonight's message is, who is he to you? Who is he to you? The, the, the backdrop, when Jesus had his closest companions, 12 of them, his disciples, the place that they had arrived in Caesarea Philippi was the, the, the backdrop of a whole bunch of known gods of the day, Greek gods, the, the, the god Pan and, and a whole lot of other Greek gods, and they're actually etched out in the mountain. There's a whole lot of shrines. In, in fact, I think I was doing some research today, and I think there are still some relics today to show this whole region. And so with, with all of the known gods of the day, and where people from all over the world would come to worship, different deity, right there with that as the backdrop, Jesus says to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say this, some say that, different names, different prophets and things. Well, who do you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? Who is he to you? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. How great to have things revealed to us by God in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You will have authority. If you go to the Great Commission at the end of this book of Matthew, Matthew 28, and Jesus says, I have been given authority, therefore you go. You go out into all the world. Pastor Brian's preaching a series right now, Go. Two-thirds of God's name is Og. <laughs> it's go, but it's also Og. <laughs> Odd. <laughs> so in this whole message of go, in this whole missio day, which means the mission of God, as we go out into the communities, we go out into our society, we've actually got the keys of heaven. We've got the keys of the kingdom to bring change, bring change in our world. And whatever we bind here on earth is bound in the heavenlies. We have that authority. But notice that that authority is closely linked with the ability to know who it is that you're following. It was only after Peter said, you are the Christ. Who is he to you? Can I submit to you tonight 
that most of the authority we have in our life comes down to who he is, who you know him to be right now. Who is he? Who is he to you? Right throughout scripture, there's been all kinds of names that God has been given. I heard someone recently praying, Holy Spirit, Father, Lord, I thank you that you died on the cross. And I'm thinking, who died? I'm confused. And it's important that we know who we worship. It's important that we know who to call upon. Some of us only ever know God as Savior. Tragically, some Christians don't know him as Lord. Because if he's Lord, we follow. If he's just Savior, thanks for fixing me for heaven. It's all good. I'm going to live my own life now. Savior and Lord. We, we, God, we, we, we worship him. We honor him. Have a, have a look at me. Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16. This is a cool story. Verse 7. Genesis 16 verse 7. It says, The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. Now the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is very often synonymous with Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Often the angel of the Lord, it typifies that that's, it's God's son. It's, it's the angel of the Lord. We know him as Jesus in the New Testament, but all throughout Old Testament scripture, you'll see the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses, appeared to Abraham. The angel of the Lord was there in the garden, the angel of the Lord. And you see this over and over again. Well, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert, a spring of water. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. The angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son. You will name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. Ishmael means God hears. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Or in some translations, he will live in a hostile land east of his brothers. And if the Gaza Strip is on the west coast, east of his brothers is the Middle East. That's important. You'll see why after. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. I have now seen the one who sees me. El Roy in Hebrew. The God who sees me. Hagar had such an encounter with God that the way she saw God changed. Now she calls him El Roy. The God who who sees me. It got me wondering, how did she see God before that? I have found in life that it's often the challenges and the circumstances, the crazy situations we find ourselves in, that are the best opportunities for God to be revealed to us in ways we've never seen him before. And where there is a temptation to run from some of life's challenges, right there in the midst of that is the best place for us to get to know God in a whole new way. Who is he to you? Who is God to you? Is he just a three-letter word? God. It's just God. 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 Next time you are praying, I hope that this resounds in your mind and you start thinking, God, who are you to me? Who do I see you to be? Not just God, not just a God, not just God. God, who is he to you? Because on the other side of who he is to you shows the authority for his power to work in your life and to change situations. We spend so much time wondering why he hasn't answered prayer, why he hasn't done things, why life is not the way it should be, the way we hear it's meant to be, and maybe it's because of the way we see him to be. Who is he to you? Who is he to you? None of us actually worship God for who he really is. We don't. We, we, we worship him for who we know him to be so far. Which is why it's important to grow in your relationship with God. Because then you know him differently. You know him more. You should know God more at the end of this year than you do right now. And the only way that's going to happen is, is if in every situation in your life you approach him. Approach him in your trouble. Approach him in your success. Approach him in your decision making. Approach him in your loneliness. Approach him in whatever circumstance you find yourself 
And God becomes to you all that you need him to be when you need him to be at most. I've been walking with God now for nearly 30 years and how I know him now is so different to how I knew him at the beginning. That There is so much more confidence I have and this is not a confidence, just a self-confidence. I'm not even that confident sometimes with me but I've become more and more confident of who he is. And so even if there's something strange in my life, my confidence is in who he is because I'm starting to realize who he is is who he's always been. And when you start to trust and get to know a God that has always been who he is, that changes everything because my life changes. My circumstances change. But who he is has always been. Oh, how I'd love to talk about the character and the nature of God, his natural and moral attributes, the things that change and the things that never change. Maybe one day we'll get into some of that. Let me tell you a little bit about Hagar, explain who Hagar was. Abraham, you know Abraham? Okay, you've heard of Abraham. So Abraham was the man that God picked to build the family of Israel all the way down through history, and we now are children of Abraham. We're children of promise. The Bible says in Hebrews that Abraham is the father of faith. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had father Abraham. I am one of them, so are you. So let's just praise the Lord right. I'm father Abraham had many sons. Look at all the fossils in the room. This is so cool. Kylie, I can't believe you know this song. This is unreal. It's because of your mum and dad, surely. That's fantastic. Kids club, yeah, yeah. So Father Abraham, Abraham is the father of our faith. We are children of promise, the Bible says, children of Abraham, because the promise was to Abraham and all who followed him. So we're people of faith, and Abraham is the father of faith. And so now we are children of faith, we are children of Abraham. All those promises come down to us because we are children of Abraham. So Abraham was chosen by God to start the family of God, the Israelites, God gives Sarah as a wife for Abraham. Hagar was Sarah's Egyptian maidservant. She wasn't Hebrew. Hagar was Egyptian and she was Sarah's maidservant. And God had given Sarah to Abraham as his wife. So it goes, Abraham and Sarah and Sarah's maidservant, her slave servant, is Hagar, right? So God had promised to bless Abraham with descendants that outnumber the stars but Sarah was barren and not able to have children. So Sarah has this idea and tells Abraham to sleep with her servant girl, Hagar, to try and make God's promise happen through her. The promise of God was taking so long to happen for Abraham and Sarah that Sarah takes her maidservant and says, Abe, you sleep with her and let's make God's promise happen. Well, Abraham, and I mean, it, it's a crazy thought that the wife would say that. What's even crazy is that the husband would actually follow through. So Abraham and Hagar come together and they have this child and his name is Ishmael. That's where we read the beginning of that story, Ishmael. And Ishmael is got heaps and heaps of descendants and it became Isaac and Ishmael, Isaac and Ishmael and the history records go on. So once this happens, Sarah gets so jealous of Hagar and Ishmael because she still hasn't got a son now that she kicks them out of their community. Kicks them out and that's where we pick up this story. So it got me wondering, how did Hagar see God before God revealed who he really was to her? Because she has this crazy encounter and she now says, El Roy, in Hebrew, you're the God who sees me. I have now seen the one who sees me. And she didn't know that God had always seen her. But at a moment in history, something happens and she now sees the one who sees her. Well, before that, all God was to her was the God of her mistress Sarah's husband, Abraham's God. That's all God was to her. But when in the middle of her trouble, God reveals himself and now she sees the one who sees her. Well, what about Sarah? Who's God to Sarah? Well, I guess to Sarah, if you're reading through this story, Sarah thought God is the one who gives promises but takes a long, 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 long time for them to happen. Well, who was he to Abraham? Who was God to Abraham? 
Man, you start reading through Genesis. This is phenomenal. Let me give you a few references. You can write these down. Um, Genesis chapter, it's, it's 14, 15, 16, 17, chapter 22, all these different areas. But he, he calls him Elohim, which means most high God. That's in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 19. He calls him El Elyon. God reveals himself as the creator. Some of these words for God we never had until he had encounters with human beings. That's the first time we see that. You know, the first time, anyway, I don't want to get distracted. Um, Jehovah Magan is, I am your shield, Genesis chapter 15. Jehovah Sakar means I will be your exceedingly great reward. This is what God says to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. There are so many different aspects. Abraham says, he looks around, he says, well, I still don't have the son of promise yet. How can you say I'm your great reward? And so then God reveals himself as El Shaddai. I am all sufficient. I am everything you need me to be when you need me to be at most. And we have all these characteristics and attributes of God because of people like this that in the middle of their trouble turn to God instead of running the other way. Abraham finally has the son of promise. His name's Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob is the 12 tribes. So he finally has his son Isaac and then God says to him, right after he circumcised him, he says, well, about eight years actually, he says, I want you to take him up to the mountain, the mountain of the Lord, which is crazy because you go start studying scripture and it's the same mountain later that Jesus is in. I want you to take him up to the mountain of the Lord and I want, to, I want you to sacrifice him there to me as an offering. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. We find out later in the New Testament that God says, I've given you my son, my only son, whom I love. The parallels are crazy in scripture. The, the redemptive connectivity is flawless through biblical history. And so he finally gets up to this mountain and his son Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the fire and we have the knife, but where's the sacrifice? Where's the offering? And right there in the middle of Abraham having to sacrifice his son, God calls out to him and, say, and he looks up and there is a, a ram caught in the bush and right there, God reveals himself to Abraham as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who will provide for you. And there's an ancient Jewish proverb that is known, go up to the mountain of the Lord because that's where he will provide. On the mountaintops, the Lord will provide. And we have all these names through history, through Bible history of who he is. But the biggest question is who is he to you? You see, one of the reasons... Right now, I have confidence that God provides is because I've seen him do it so many times. But if you look at all the different occurrences in my life where I've lost and had things back and where I've needed something and God has provided and all the different areas where I've just trusted him for provision, that all links back to a stake in the ground where one day when we were early married, 20 years ago, when we were just married, we were on holidays in Queensland and our house got broken into, our apartment got broken into and the thieves stole everything. They even stole the wedding presents that hadn't yet been unwrapped. And we were young pups. We had no insurance. We didn't know. We lost everything. You can't get it back. It's all gone. And Julia's parents who live down here, my parents were on the Gold Coast. And so Julia's parents tell my parents, which is where we were staying, and they were all talking with each other and they didn't want to tell us because we'd get upset. And eventually they must have talked themselves into telling us, otherwise they thought we'd be more upset if we knew that they knew that we hadn't told us yet. So finally they tell us in the middle of our holiday, and Julia and I, because my parents aren't Christians, we excuse ourselves from the house and we walk up the street. And we just gave the whole situation to the Lord. Instead of getting angry and getting annoyed and feeling like it was God's fault and how come you're not looking after us, we didn't do any of that. We just turned to him. And in the middle of a crazy situation where our life had been turned upside down financially, we turned to him and he revealed himself as provider. And when he did that, within the, the next three or four weeks, we had item for item replaced from random people and from crazy situations and we watched miraculously the, the, the provision of God come back into our lives. And that was a great moment for us. For every next season, we had confidence that he is who he says he is. And now we see him that way. When Eli was born 11 years ago, three weeks after he was born, we were going to the um, normal checkup and they discovered a murmur 
and the, the she just blurted it out the doctor just blurted it out and then we were like well what, what, what do you mean Murma? what do you what, what do you she said i'm so sorry i shouldn't have said that and so we discovered through um, ECG and everything that he had a hole in his heart. And this was, uh, it was a five millimeter hole in a small heart. It's, uh, it's quite big. Anyone who's been involved with VSDs and things, ventricular septal defects. And so it was a tragic situation and it was looking like open heart surgery. And Julia asked the worst question you ever ask a doctor. What's the worst thing that could happen? Well, he could die. <laughs> I'm like, babe, why'd you ask that question? And so we're on this journey now of making sure that we had the right people standing with us in faith. And the reason we approached that situation differently than we would have maybe in years gone past, and the reason we stood in such a way and had great confidence in Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, you know why? Is because that wasn't the first time it happened. You go back years. I've seen so many situations where God has shown himself as the Lord who heals. In fact, you go right back to when I was dating Julia, we weren't even married. 25 years ago when she was doing her HSC, she contracted glandular fever a couple of weeks out and it was about to wipe her out of her HSC. And we were praying for her and her mum and dad were praying for her. And I remember walking up Martin Place in the city one day. They lived in Wollongong and I lived up here. We we're still dating a long distance relationship. Uh, not that long these days in the context of long. Uh, but I was walking up Martin Place and I still remember the street crossing up near Castle Ray Street and I just had this Im immense confidence and conviction in God to pray right there and then. With people all around me under my breath, I claimed it and she was healed. And because of that, what should have taken weeks and weeks to recover, 10 days in, miraculously healed, that created a moment for me where I saw God in a way I'd not seen him before. So now, who is he to you? Because to me, he's healer. To me, he's provider. When I was bullied at high school and I became depressed and suicidal and tried to take my life, when he revealed himself to me as I stood on the edge of a cliff and was about to throw myself off, and when the wind came up the mountain and pressed me back off my feet with a no, I see you. I know him as El Roy, the God who sees me. Don't you think in every challenging situation that I've been in, some of them have been worse than that situation, that I know that he sees me? Because it happened when I was 15. All these years later, see, none of us actually worship God for who he completely is, only who you know him to be so far. So who is he to you? Because I believe God can be everything you need him to be when you need him to be at most. If you look at this last story, we'll get the band to come back up. Uh, John chapter 4. John chapter 4. This is a crazy redemptive connection. We read how the angel of the Lord spoke to a woman named Hagar in a spring of water. Look at this. Here's the angel of the Lord now. His name's Jesus. It says here, um, verse 4. John 4.4, 4. now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground, Jacob, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob as well. This is crazy stuff. We're talking 33 AD, 2,000 years later when the angel of the Lord had met with Hagar. Here is Jesus now. He goes through here. He has to journey. He sits down. It was the sixth hour. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. God would never accept me. And here he is revealing himself to her. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I am El Shaddai, your all sufficient one. The whole time Jesus is trying to reveal who he is. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well? I could just imagine Jesus thinking, I was there with Hagar. Don't ask if I'm greater than Jacob. I was there. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? And Jesus says, Jehovah Jireh, I am your provider. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may, 
that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here and drawing water. He said to her, go call your husband and come back. I don't have a husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you don't have a husband. The fact is you've been married five times. You've had five husbands and the man you are now with is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. You know stuff. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you Jews claim that the place that we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, time is coming. I love that he said, believe me, woman. <laughs> That's funny. Believe me, woman. A time is, I'm sure he didn't say it that way. A, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews, from Abraham, not from Ishmael, who was Hagar. You've got to get this. Do you, know who the, do you know who the Samaritans were? The Samaritans were considered half-breeds to the Israelites because they had intermarried. When you look at the, you've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. When they all came out of Egypt and they went across into the Promised Land, only nine and a half tribes went across into the Promised Land. Two and a half tribes stayed on the other side of the Jordan River. Do you know the two and a half tribes on the other side intermarried with the Ishmaelites? That's the Samaritans. 2,000 years before, the angel of the Lord is sitting with Hagar and Ishmael and says, I will increase you. 2,000 years later, the redemptive picture comes back together. And all these names, all the way God reveals himself through Scripture, Jesus finally appears and says, I am everything you need me to be. Everything. Is it any wonder when you get down to verse 27 and she runs back to the, her town, her hometown and she says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Do you know what she's saying? El Roy. I have just seen the one who sees me. Does that picture sound familiar? 2,000 years before, I have just seen the one who sees me. Do you know whatever you need right now, God can give. You don't even need to have confidence in this meeting. You don't need, your confidence doesn't need to be in an atmosphere, in a band. You don't need to be confident in what's happened before, what's about to happen next. All you need to be confident is that God is who He's always been. He's always been. He's always been eternal. He's always been just. He's always been loving, patient, kind. He's full of justice. God makes choices towards your good being. He wants to bless you, wants to help you. So what I would love us to do tonight in these last moments that we have, I think it'd be great if we turned, if we, if we could, we all have to agree to do this. If we would agree that this carpet space down the front here, let's agree tonight that this space is sanctified, which means it's set apart to God. We give it to Him. We say, Lord, this space down here is yours. Down in the aisles, if we can't fit everyone, this space is yours. And we give it to you and, and anyone here who needs to meet with Him. Whoever needs to meet with God, when, whatever you need God to be for you right now, He can, he can be that when you need to be, to be at most. This space down here, we will set apart for Him. And you can make an active physical step and come out of your seat. And out here, you can meet with God and you can know God in a way you've never known Him before. If you're sick, come out here and meet God who heals. If you are in lack, come out here and meet God who provides. If you are in depression, come out here and meet God who sees. Come out and meet here, God the Creator, God who is all sufficient, God who is full of righteousness, God who is your, your, your mentor, your leader, your counsellor, your helper, your guide, your ever-present help in times of trouble. Come out and meet God who is able to do all things for those who believe. Can we stand together? Any person right now, every person, whatever it is, if you're in a, a place of despondency, if you're thinking, man, I just, that you, you know hearts, there are hearts right now and you know you need to respond. So I'm giving this to you. Here is the space down here and we're gonna worship Him. No matter what your age, no matter how long you've been in church, no matter where you're at right now, older people, younger people, whatever life has thrown at you, don't run from Him. Let's run to Him. Let's sanctify this space out here and give it to the Lord.
everything that we find this night in your presence. And Lord, we pray for this week ahead. May it be full of your presence. May it be full of your blessing. May it be full of your favor. May it be full of your wisdom and your creativity flowing in and through our lives. May it be full of opportunities to be a great blessing and to tell people that your good news and what you have done in us. May this week be a week where we get to play a part in seeing your kingdom established. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Come on, can we thank Joel LaBelle for a fantastic message tonight? Wonderful. So brilliant. That's it. Thanks for being in church tonight. We're going to have a great weekend next weekend. We have Frank Damasio with us, and he is an incredible pastor, author, and you're going to love hearing what he's got to bring. We're going to have a great weekend in church. Sunday nights have been incredible, so I encourage you, next Sunday night, we're going to be having a great night, and we've got a new 3 p.m. service, which is going to be cool. Next Saturday morning is our foundation breakfast. Open invite. You are invited. Come and find out about the foundation and what it is all about, and I uh, hope that you can be a part of that. Just let us know that you're coming so we can cater for it, and that would be brilliant. We're going to sing a song of praise, and uh, praise the name of